Hello, my name is Amir Saeed and I'll be discussing dermatology, uh, looking at eczema, acne and psoriasis and some other dermatological conditions. Um, the fo it's dermatology in GP which means that the management will, uh, will focus on what is done in primary care, not secondary care. Um, so these are the learning objectives to cover the symptoms, signs and management of eczema, to cover the symptoms, signs and management of acne, to cover the symptoms, signs and management of psoriasis. Um, and there's some other additional learning objectives to cover the symptoms, signs and management of lichen planus. And finally, to cover the management of conditions which affect hair. So we'll begin with eczema. Eczema is a chronic, itchy, inflammatory skin condition. The exact cause of eczema isn't known, but evidence suggests that mutations in the phalagrin gene is an important cause for eczema. So the phalagrin gene, its function is very important in the skin barrier. So if there's a mutation in this gene, that can lead to a dysfunction in the skin barrier. It can lead to water loss, which means there's dryness and itching of the skin. Um, allergens can also penetrate or this skin barrier much more easily. And when they do, that can lead to a inflammatory response, an IgE response. And also there's um, colonization uh, of uh, the skin barrier and the skin uh, with bacteria such so as Staphylococcus aureus. So that 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 is a theory or, um, of how eczema uh, may arise. Um, but most patients, what's really important to know from a clinical standpoint is that most patients with eczema have a positive family history of atopy, which means that. If you suspect a person has eczema, um, you know, it's important to ask if there's other family members that have asthma or hay fever as well, because patients with eczema usually, you know, have asthma or they have um, hay fever. So possible trigger factors include soap and detergent, animal dander, house dust mites, extreme temperatures, rough clothing, pollen, certain foods and stress. So in terms of the clinical features, so this is a picture of classic eczema. So eczema, in terms of the symptoms a patient may see, may, you know, ex, um, complain of severe itching, um, you know, a rash on the skin, which is usually um, localised in children uh, to the flexural surfaces for the antecubital fossa and the popliteal fossa. That's usually in children, in infants, in babies. The eczema can be on the face or the scalp. So patients may complain of weeping as well. Um, and the itching can be so severe it may affect their sleep and routine as well in schoolwork. So in terms of signs, when you suspect as, uh, eczema, what you might see is excoriation marks because of the itching, a lichenification uh, of the skin as well. The rash is not very demarcated as well, um, which is opposite to psoriasis because in psoriasis you have very well demarcated plaques. So there are different clinical variants of eczema. So there's follicular eczema, which is centered on hair follicles and can be seen on the abdomen, uh, particularly on pigmented skin. There's also discoid eczema, uh, which consists of very round lesions. Uh, they're more often on the limbs and can also be, uh, can also be a sign of infection. Uh, there's papular eczema, uh, which can occur on scratched areas of pigmented skin. Something particularly to note is eczema hepaticum. So if patients are very systemically unwell, they look very poorly. 
uh, they don't look well, um, and they may, if they have multiple punched out lesions or vesicles, that might suggest um, herpes simplex infection and eczema hepaticum, and they need to be referred um, urgently to dermatology. So if distributed on the forehead or perinasally chin or on the ears, on the chest, and the scalp is very flaky, or if there's a scaly rash, it may be seborrheic eczema. And that can be present in uh, HIV infections and even Parkinson's disease. And if the eczema is located or localised to the palms and soles, where there's blisters or vesicles, uh, that is referred to as pomflex eczema. And if it's only localised on the lower legs, where there's swelling of the ankles and prominent veins, um, that's described as venous eczema. So in terms of management, um, it's important to break down the eczema or the severity of the eczema into mild, moderate and severe. So in terms of mild eczema, if, there's, if there are areas of dry skin and infrequent itching, then that's mild eczema. In moderate eczema, there are areas of dry skin, there's frequent itching, and there is redness, with or without excoriation and localised skin thickening, or lichenification. Severe eczema is if there's widespread areas of dry skin, incessant itching and redness. So, we'll, before we look at the management, it's also important to think about corticosteroids and the strength of corticosteroids because they are uh, one of the main drugs that are used to treat eczema. So mild uh, strength corticosteroids are 1 to 2.5% hydrocortisone. Moderate strength, uh, things like Umivate, diluted potent uh, uh, corticosteroids exist. You have potent uh, corticosteroids such as betanovate and very potent corticosteroids are dermovate. So with mild eczema it's really important to prescribe emollients. Um, now there's no set limit as to how much you should prescribe in terms of emollients. Um, you, can, the, the, you should advise the patient to put as much emollient uh, as they want. They should use as much uh, as they can and they should use it very regularly. Um, and there is no particular emollient that is, uh, that is advised. What, the, what is advised is that the emollient used should be the patient's preference. So, and it's important to use emollients because they prolong the time to a flare of eczema, they reduce the number of flares of eczema, and they reduce the need uh, for topical corticosteroids. So, in addition to an emollient, it's important to prescribe a mild topical corticosteroid, such as hydrocortisone, um, 1%. Now, that treatment should be continued for 48 hours after the flare has been controlled and it's important to note that um, there are some side effects with topical corticosteroids such as um, stretch marks or areas of thin skin. In terms of moderate eczema it's very important to again pres prescribe emollients but in this case pres prescribe a moderately potent topical corticosteroid um, and that in this case, the treatment should be continued for five days after the flare has been controlled. Now, if there's also severe itch, um, you can consider prescribing um, a trial of non-sedating antihistamines, not to control the eczema, but to for the for the itch. In terms of severe eczema, again, emollients are very important. This time you can prescribe a potent topical corticosteroid such as betanovate uh, and again treatment should be continued for five days um, after the flare has been controlled. Now it's important to note that for certain areas of the skin you can't use certain potencies of topical corticosteroid 
Um, so for delicate areas of skin, such as the face and flexures, um, it's probably best to use a moderate potency corticosteroid. Um, and if itching is severe and affecting sleep, uh, it could be important to consider prescribing a short course, short course of sedating antihistamine. So moving on to acne. So acne is characterized by blockage and inflammation of the pilosebaceous unit. And the pilosebaceous unit includes the hair follicle, the hair shaft and the sebaceous gland. So what happens is that androgens, uh, pathophysiology of acne includes high androgen levels, which stimulate sebaceous cells to produce increased sebum. Uh, there's also follicular hyperkeratinization, which leads to the formation of a microcomedone. Uh, so there's also proliferation of bacteria as well within the sebum of in hair follicles. And there's also inflammation as well, uh, particularly neutrophils uh, can accumulate. Um, Um, so in mild acne, you have predominantly non-inflamed lesions, so open and closed comedones. So open, closed comedones, white head, black heads, uh, with few inflammatory lesions. Moderate acne is more widespread, uh, but here you can see papules and pustules. In severe acne, there is again papules and pustules there may be nodules or cysts and there may be scarring so mild acne is only the open and closed comedones of whiteheads and blackheads uh, moderate acne papules and pustules severe acne you know nodules cysts and scarring so in terms of the management of um, mild to moderate acne um, is is to use a single topical treatment this can include a topical retinoid on its own or in combination with benzoyl peroxide. Uh, it's important to note that retinoids are contraindicated in pregnancy and breastfeeding. You can use a topical antibiotic, uh, for example, clindamycin 1%. Now, antibiotics should always be prescribed in combination with benzoyl peroxide to prevent the development of bacterial resistance. And also azelaic acid on its own can be used. In terms of moderate acne, if you use topical preparations um, and they aren't effective, then you could consider using an oral antibiotic, such as tetracyclines. These include lemicycline or doxycycline for a maximum of three months. Um, the reason why it's specifically tetracyclines because uh, antibiotics like macrolides, like clindamycin, uh, the bacterium that is predominant in acne is resistant to that type of antibiotic. So that's why tetracyclines are used. Now, if you've used the oral antibiotic for three months and it's not effective, then you can change to an alternative antibiotic. Now, if the person doesn't, if the person has had two courses of antibiotics, or if they're beginning to scar, then you can refer to a dermatologist to for further treatment or specialised treatment. In women, you might instead of using antibiotics, you might want to use um, the combined oral contraceptive pill like Dianet. Um, and that might be considered in moderate to severe acne, whether the treatments have failed. So I know that, um, this is more secondary care management, but I think it's just important to know isotretinoin um, is a treatment for severe acne uh, with scarring. Um, it's quite an effective treatment because it targets all the aspects involved in the pathophysiology of acne so that you know it reduces inflammation it reduces sebum production um, it is however it does have some adverse effects um, it's teratogenic 
there can be drying of mucous membranes, there can be hair loss, um, there can be muscle aches, and there can be abnormalities of lipid um, and liver functions. So it's important to do LFTs and um, lipids as well when, when if commencing this treatment. But usually in primary care they don't start it, it's usually dermatologists. So move on to psoriasis. Psoriasis is a systemic immune mediated inflammatory skin disease which typically has a chronic relapsing remitting course and may have male and joint involvement. So in terms of the clinical features of psoriasis, um, whereas eczema is not well demarcated, um, psoriasis is, it's, it has plaques, um, red coloured salmon coloured plaques, which have um, silver scale on them. You can, there is a sign, clinical sign, auspice sign, that is where you scratch the surface of the plaque and it causes point bleeding. Um, it's usually, plaque psoriasis is usually localised to the elbow, to the knees, uh, to the scalp and to the, to the sacrum. Um, the other picture shows male involvement, so that's very common. Approximately 50% of patients with psoriasis will have some form of male involvement. So in terms of nail psoriasis, that can include onycholysis, pitting of the nail bed, pitting of the nail, sorry. And that's why it's important to ask if you suspect a patient has psoriasis, you know, have they noticed any changes to their nails? Have they noticed any joint pain as well? Um, because it's important to be aware of psoriatic arthritis as well. So there are different, uh, like with eczema, different clinical variants of, of psoriasis. So there's guttate psoriasis, which occurs about two weeks after uh, infections such as pharyngitis or tonsillitis. It consists of a large number of small plaques, which are about one centimeter, and they're usually on the trunk, on the back, uh, and and on the face. They're usually self-limiting. Um, but in some cases, uh, the gut psoriasis can lead to chronic plaque psoriasis. There's also erythema, erythrodermic psoriasis, which consists of widespread erythema. It is an emergency um, because it can lead to um, cardiac failure and inability to uh, control temperature. There's also flexural psoriasis as these are plaques which occur in moist flexural areas such as the axilla, uh, the groin, um, the submammary areas and the umbilicus. It is less scaly but again symmetry suggests psoriasis and there's palmal plantar pustulosis and that consists of yellow or brown sterile pustules within the plaques and um, that's usually localised to the part of the sun. So in terms of initial management, there's two um, topical treatments used, a potent topical corticosteroid plus a topical vitamin D preparation. Uh, it's important to note that, the, that they are taken at different times during the day. So the topical vitamin D preparation should be applied in the morning and the topical steroid should be applied at night. So you will continue that treatment for four weeks and then at four weeks, a review should take place. So if there's a good initial response to the treatment, you should continue the topical cortical steroid and the topical vitamin D preparation until the skin is clear or nearly clear. You should continue. Now, if there are other options as well, so if the response isn't that good, then you should continue. You should still continue the treatment with those two agents, a potent topical corticosteroid plus uh, vitamin D preparation for another four weeks. Or, if the treatment hasn't worked, another option is to actually stop the potent corticosteroid and then only apply vitamin D twice a day 
up to 12 weeks. Now it's important to note that the person should not apply corticosteroids for more than eight weeks at any one site. And if you have to, if you want to apply corticosteroids again, then you should wait for uh, after four weeks. So after four weeks, if the treatment is going well, continue it. If not, uh, you can still use the vitamin D preparation and topical corticosteroid, or you can stop the corticosteroid and just keep on applying the vitamin D preparation. So after eight weeks, if there is a poor response to both the topical corticosteroid and topical vitamin D, then you advise the patient to stop um, the corticosteroid and only apply a vitamin D preparation twice a day. Now, if they've used vitamin D uh, and it's about eight to 12 weeks, eight to 12 weeks into treatment. If the vitamin D on its own hasn't worked, then you can switch to just using a potent corticosteroid on its own and applying that twice a day for up to four weeks. Or you can use a cold towel. Um, if there's ongoing treatment failure, then that may warrant a referral to dermatology. So, in summary for this slide, so at eight weeks, um, if the corticosteroid and vitamin D haven't worked, then you can switch to just using vitamin D twice a day. Now, at eight to 12 weeks of treatment, if the vitamin D on its own hasn't worked, then you might get rid of the vitamin D, start using the corticosteroid on its own for up to four weeks, or you can switch completely to a different topical agent, such as cold towel. Um, but again, it's important to emphasise if the treatment isn't working, then you know there is a um, then you can uh, refer to dermatology if 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 needed. So we'll move on to lichen planus. So lichen planus is a dermatological condition which results in a papular pruritic eruption. So the key characteristics include a rash which occurs on the soles, uh, palms, genitalia and the flexor surfaces on the palms. The rash is polygonal in shape with white streaks uh, which is called Wickham stray. Um, oral, there is oral involvement in, in some cases and that can consist of a whitey lace pattern on the buccal mucosa. Uh, lichen planus is also associated uh, with a number of drugs such as gold, quinine and uh, thiazides. So the management for this is if drugs are suspected as a cause discontinue them um, and usually topical corticosteroids are the mainstay of treatment. And finally, we'll look at hair and conditions affecting hair. So this is the hair cycle, which starts with anagen, which is the growth phase. Um, this is where you have the mature hair. Catagen is where the growth, uh, growth, growth actually stops. Um, the growth phase stops. And telogen is where the hair the existing hair falls out and a new uh, hair is is um, is beginning to grow. So anagen, catagen and telogen. So the condition that we'll focus on is alopecia areata. This is an autoimmune condition. Um, it's where you have hair hair loss or well demarcated areas of hair loss. Now, when you look with a dermatoscope, there'll be residual white hairs among darker hairs, and the darker hair is lost first, leaving white hair. And the follicular opening is seen, so it's non-scarring. Now, there is a clinical sign in alopecia areata, and that's the exclamation mark hairs. So, these are little hairs remaining which are fatter and darker at the tip than at the scalp. Now, the reason why they're darker at the tip and fatter at the tip 
than at the actual scalp is because there's inflammation um, which surrounds the follicle. Uh, and so that's why, you know, at the scalp, the hair is thin, but at the tip, um, you know, they're more fatter and thicker. Uh, there's different patterns uh, of alopecia areata. Um, these are a physis pattern, which affects the posterior aspect of the scalp. The totalis pattern, which is includes complete scalp loss. And universalis alopecia areata, which is complete um, body hair loss. So we've kind of covered um, you know, eczema, acne, psoriasis, lichen planus, and alopecia areata. Um, so it's important, I think, you know, to make sure you're well aware of the management of um, these conditions. And I think a good use source to use is clinical knowledge summaries. Their particular focus is on the management in primary care. So it's a very good website to use.